James Cargo Motorcycle Shipping, sponsors Under the Visor. As with everything else on the Christmas special, we're doing things just a little bit differently. And Under the Visor, this month, we have two guests. We have Austin Vince and Lois Price. Welcome. Thank you. Howdy. Lovely to see both of you again. Great to be here. Is this... Well, how long has it been since you've been interviewed together? Because I see a lot of interviews where you've done separately, but how long has it been since you've been interviewed together? I don't know if we ever had. Never. Actually, yeah, this, no. is a, this is a groundbreaking experience. And not, and never before filmed in a, uh, a cool person's storage facility. <laughs> is, it, is that where we are? <laughs> <laughs> well, we do, we do like to be first. So we, yeah, well, that's fantastic to have you here together. Um, I do have lots of questions about the two of you together. I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> <Really? ritual. laughs> A lot of people have got questions. That's what the internet is for. That's the whole set that you should get. But I do have some questions uh, for, for you about kind of how you both got into motorcycling. Is it? We'll start kind of with, with the basics. Sure. Uh, so, Lois, let me just start with you. Now, as I understand it, you were in a corporate job at the BBC, mm -hmm. and then something made you think, I don't know what, I'm going to go off and ride all the way through America, just kind of tell us what happened. Yeah, sure, so I essentially worked, you know, my whole adult life since I left school and I ended up in a, a job that was tedious, and it wasn't a bad job, but it was a job that just involved trudging up the stairs and sitting in a grey office, nine to five, Monday to Friday, and I just, you know, like so many of us thought, oh no, I can't do this for the rest of my life. So that was my, you know, late 20s crisis, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, that feeling... Um, I suppose coincided with me passing my bike test and me and my best friend had just thought we'd learn to ride bikes together, we thought it'd be a laugh. I got no um, biking in my family or anything like that. I didn't really know anyone that rode motorcycles, so I just thought it looked like a cool thing to do, and it was. Uh, we passed uh, our tests, uh, I don't think she ever rode a bike again, and then I, um, I got into riding uh, classic British bikes, BSA and stuff like that. And so I think it was that combination of kind of itchy feet, boring job, motorcycle license, it was like Bling, light bulb. Oh, okay. Now I know what to do with my life sort of idea. So um, I packed in the job and, well, I started looking into sort of having a motorcycle adventure. I didn't have a clue what that meant or, or I just knew that I wanted to see the world and that a bike seemed like the, the best way to do that. And so um, it's 2002. And of course, at that time, the internet uh, and, and motorcycling, adventure motorcycling on the internet was still quite lean, really. There was Horizons Unlimited, but that was probably about it. So, of course, Chris Scott's Adventure Motorcycling Handbook was, was the kind of Bible. And so I came across that pretty quickly. And that really tr transformed everything. Because I read that cover to cover millions of times. <coughs> and I, I realised, oh, wow, these are just normal people who do this stuff. So if they can do it, I can do it. And that was really the kind of kicking off point. So of all the places you could choose to go around the world, you chose to go Alaska then through South America. What yeah. did you manage to do that? Well, initially, you know, you think big. I thought, oh, I want to go all the way around the world. And I soon realised that I probably wouldn't be able to afford to do that. So I decided to pick a good, neat, you know, from A to B type of thing. I didn't want to just meander aimlessly. So I, I, and I, I love a lot of stuff about America, uh, music particularly. So I'd always wanted to kind of do that West Coast ride. And then I thought, well, I might as well just keep going. I wanted to go somewhere hot and sunny. I wasn't interested in anything like Siberia, anything cold. I loved it, the heat. So I, looking at the continent, I thought, well, it makes sense to start right at the top and go right to the bottom. So that was the that was thinking behind that. And when you went, were you planning on writing a book before you left? Or like, uh, Not at all. This is a kind of really, in a way, um, the best thing that came out of it was this kind of whole new world and career and everything that I hadn't really even considered. I left my job, had no idea what I was going to do when I got back. I think this is the thing about taking the leap of a, of a trip like that. So many other things come from it. Obviously, you have a great time, you ride some great roads, meet some great people, but so many other things come out of taking that leap. And for me, that was the greatest thing, really. I used to just send emails back to my brother, who was, he's a web wizard, and he made this website for me. And like I say, it was kind of early days. There was no blogging or social media in those days. But he would put these emails up, and I used to get my photos developed in shops it print, I'm sure that people had invented digital cameras in 2002, but I hadn't really got it. I'm a bit of a late adopter. And I would post the photos back, uh, and he or Austin would scan them and then put them on the website. It was all very kind of lo-fi in a digital way. And um, something just happened with the, with the website, and the posts were kind of getting linked and, and watched, and I was getting all these views. 
and it just went from there really. Um, and so a friend of mine put me in touch with a, um, an agent, a book agent, and she liked what I was writing and said, "Okay, do the rest of the trip, and then go home, and, and we'll look at what to do next." And it sort of all went from there. So it was a real amazing thing that kind of came out of nowhere. And how long was that trip? Ten months. Ten months. Yeah. The obvious question: What was the high point? What was the low point? very hard to say. For me, a moment that I will always remember with great joy was the, the crossing from America into Mexico, because that is that sensation of, wow, okay, here we go, this is it now. Because America's fun, but it's easy. And it's, you know, just like being at home, you can talk to everybody, you get everything you want. So there's none of the challenges, that, which was the motivation for me, was to get out and just throw myself out there and see what would happen and have crazy shit happening to me all the time. Um, so once I went into Mexico, that's when I felt like the adventure was really starting, and I, I've always loved Baja, Mexico, for that reason, because it represents like the, the big start of it all. Okay, and, and, and well, low, yeah, low, low points. Ah, well, uh, readers of, of, of my book, Lois on Loose, will rem remember maybe the um, character that I rode with for a while who had a terrible, brutal, awful crash in, in Bolivia. And uh, that was a particular low point, sort of seeing somebody almost die, obviously, in front of me. Um, so that was pretty, pretty traumatic. Um, other than that, I think probably some of the border crossings, a lot of people who have crossed through Central America, I mean, those days, I think, I think they're probably a bit easier now, but they were quite um, traumatic as well, and they could be expensive and <laughs> a bit brutal. And I remember feeling, uh, crossing into Honduras, I was kind of getting roughed up by the police and having to be, you know, hand over money and kept, you know, in horrible rooms for hours and then and stuff. And so that was a bit intimidating, I think. And I think that was the only time that I really had a kind of, oh, this is, you know, this, this is not fun anymore. Mm. This is a bit scary. So, but um, really that trip was just an enormous amount of fun and, and really just so much easier than I ever imagined it would be. And it was just life transforming and fantastic. So. I'm very, I'm very busy. It's on my to-do list. It's so, absolutely, somewhere, somewhere the time. yeah, it's, it's wonderful, really good. Well, we'll come back and talk about the other trips yeah. and around particular. I want to hear more about it. Oh, sure, well. yeah. yeah. So, Austin. Lovely to see you. Good, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mondo Enduro, which I, I, I watched for the first time ten years ago, actually sitting in the building. Like last on night. Last night. It was this car. It was on my phone, the little speaker, next to the camp, in the Pyrenees. Uh, and and that, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, that was the second time. I watched it at home and I watched it with my friends when we were away. Uh, and so uh, I guess you know, lots of people in the audience have, have seen that. And, uh, but before that, and we, we've talked before about the trips you used to do with your brother before you were even thinking necessarily about doing that, you know, that huge trip. And you used to go away around Europe. But what, what, what changed your mind or, or motivated you to just go from, I'm going on trips with my brother for a couple of weeks around Europe, and actually know me and Six friends. Yeah. yeah six yeah. friends. We're actually going to go and go for 440 odd days and do this incredible, you know, almost record breaking challenge. What, what, what kind of went from there to there? How did you, how did you um, there was. When I, uh, when I left um, Sandhurst, I had two weeks leave and my brother kind of hij you know, hijacked me, kidnapped me, and he, he, he rendered me to Morocco and we went riding around there, two up on his FJ 1200, and that was great fun. Uh, and we were up in the Rift Mountains. Only anybody who knows Morocco will know that we're just like, you know, 60 miles from the Mediterranean, so hardly the Moroccan incursion. But we'd see these bikes, I don't know what they were, Africa Twins or something, but they all had German number plates covered in dust. With This was in 88, you know, this would be April 89, these guys come out, come in here, going past us. We we're on our nice clean FJ 1200 in like leathers, clean leathers, all of that. And, we're going along thinking we're outlaws and crazy and uh, these blokes going past the goggles all covered in the dust and the bike dust all glued onto the oil leak of the cylinder <laughs> block of the these bikes and they just poof, and they went past the like you know as they went past us it was you could you could see there, there wasn't so much disdain but we realized we'd completely missed the point <laughs> and uh, we thought that driving a bike around the streets of morocco would be exciting of course but we were we were learning we didn't we just didn't know, and uh, and so then we had this idea of going around Eastern Europe in the in the summer of '91 when the Berlin Wall had just come down and had a stroke. All of these um, uh, incredibly convoluted visa regulations had all evaporated overnight. So suddenly you could drive to through Poland. You know, you know, Poland, Czechoslovakia was a, like an exotic location in the '70s and '80s. You'd never meet anyone who'd, who'd driven around Czechoslovakia. 
So suddenly we did, so we did all of this huge, uh, not huge, three week trip around Eastern Europe. And the thing that hit us there that we weren't ready for was we went looking for like mountains and waterfalls and, uh, and stuff like that. But we found pollution, factories, uh, unbelievably ugly public housing, uh, road signs that were all fallen down and looked like they were made by drunk people. Then we found drunk people. And, uh, and there was a, a, a fascinating crapness to the whole of Eastern Europe <laughs> that, um, I, that was absolutely the key, the, the key part of the trip, not the motorcycle, or the distance or the sunsets or whatever. And, just, and about that, and so we got back from the trip, we had loved it, and we just thought, well, look, we've got to do some, you know, there's got to be some kind of natural progression to this, because we loved it, it was so much fun, and everyone, you know, and we realised that most of our friends weren't having those kinds of holidays. And, uh, and then somebody said, do you think it's possible to drive across Russia? And everyone said, no, you're not allowed to do that. And then we saw in about 90, to something like that in British Bike Magazine, which I was subscribed to. This guy called Sean Hawker from Bristol wrote a BSA to Australia, which is not a big deal. It's been happening all through the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But this guy, Sean Hawker, his route went through from Turkey into Georgia, then Azerbaijan, then you got the ferry across the Caspian Sea, and then he had a government escort that took him across Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, and then he got out of Kazakhstan up to Karakorum and all that stuff, and then down into India that way. Now, I wasn't a student of this stuff, but I was pretty sure I'd never heard of anything like that happening before. All the Pakistan countries, we never knew the names of them properly or where they were, how they fitted next to each other, and this, you know, this, this extraordinary black hole that was Central Asia that no one could, could sketch a map of it or anything. So I read this article, and uh, we, in the good old days, you wrote a letter to British Bike Magazine, more to me, or whoever it was, up in... Who did... Uh, who, 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 are they Mortons? Are they Mortons? Go Mortons. Yeah, I've seen. Got this guy Sean Hawker's ad uh, address, or they forwarded our letter to him. He phoned me up one day at school where I was working, and we got <coughs> chatting. We all arranged very quickly. This was an emergency meeting. All of our mates with, I had like four friends with motorcycle licenses, and, my, and Joel, my brother, was one of them. We all went down to Bristol, met him, and he said, "Yeah, you, you know." And he, of course, like any Englishman, so this is like 1993, and he's, I think, the first Englishman to ride a motorcycle across Kazakhstan, and so we like just. Were in awe, sitting at his at his knees, just listening to these stories. He's <laughs> <laughs> very big. It was it was really exciting, and and at that time, I just thought I had a brainwave. Uh, I had a free period at school. I'd gone into uh, the library at school, and for some reason, found myself in the kind of geography section, and found a, uh, there was a, we had a the school had a full collection of time life picture book essay, coffee table type books. One was called uh, The Blue Ridge Parkway, one was called The Sahara, one was called uh, The Coral Reefs of Australia, something like that, but one was called Soviet Deserts and Mountains. And, I, and that name jumped out at me and I thought, there's no such thing. Because you know, I thought Soviet, mud, swamp, snow, Siberia. And so I took this book out, and it had a map in it, all these countries, star on this, star on the other, and I'd never heard of them. What? And I started looking through it, then the Sean Hawker thing, and I became fascinated with this idea of Central Asia. And, um, and I got a book about, uh, about the Great Game, about the hi history of British involvement out there, and all these army officers in the hole, in the ground in Merv, and, in, and, the, and the minaret in Bukhara, and Samarkand, and all these, these fabulous flying carpet style names and everything. Then this weird overlay of the Soviet Union on top of it, you're not quite sure culturally what you're getting. So uh, that's uh, once we got once we thought of all of that stuff, and then somebody said, "You didn't get across the Soviet Union?" Then we said, "Well, let's let's try." Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to ask you all the stories. I mean, there's so many stories that, that came from the video itself. But the guys you went with, obviously, you sent stuff to your brother, but not because not everybody finished the trip. But are you still in touch with all the other guys? Oh yeah, totally, with? totally. We so, you know that was a uh, even the blokes who left early on day 66. That was a, still a pretty intense shared experience just mm -hmm. to drive from. From London to Irkutsk together, and we had plenty of, uh, you know, because we were so useless and had no idea what we were doing. We had so many. You know, every day there was an internet incident, you know, and uh, and um, so it was it was exciting. And so yeah, we we, we you know we see all those guys. It was great. I was really upset that they left early, but they had their reasons. And it's not the army, you know. You don't can't tell them, you know, you can't go. You've got to stay. You've got to keep going. You've got to keep going. So they did their thing. You know, I'd like to quietly imagine that they slightly regret it now in the course of time, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah.
But when you're talking about those, those days, incidents happen. This is a quick question for both of you. Yeah. Um, when I did uh, the, the first two big trips, and they were very similar compared to the stuff you guys have done, but that, that sense of the unknown, every day, I woke up terrified yeah. because of what was coming. And actually, when I look back on it, I have very fond memories, but I'm not sure at the time, because they, they were not, I, didn't, I, don't, I hadn't had time to get used to them. I wasn't away long enough to get used to where I, where I was going or how I was going. I felt terrified in days. Only afterwards I felt kind of yeah, fondness of memory. That's how, cool. Yeah, so when you're away, how much of it is excitement? How much of it is worry or terror about where you're going or what is unknown? Does, does it turn into excitement every day? For me, I was more scared before I left because of sort of the overactive imagination of all the awful things that might happen to me. And part of the reason that I chose to do my first trip that way round, from north to south, was so I could sort of ease myself in in, in North America. Because, you know, I, I'd never really ridden outside of the M25. <laughs> I mean, I, no, I've been to France once. I decided to do this trip. I thought, I'd better go to France. <laughs> so, um, but, so I didn't really know if I was going to even like being on the road, living, you know, like that. So... So, it, but there's definitely a period of adapting, and every trip is the same. It, it's not like you do one trip, and obviously it gets easier, but there's always this kind of, I'd say it's about two weeks where everything's horrible, and you hate it, and, it, and it's awful. And then you, you kind of get into a different mind frame, and you just allow everything to happen to you, and then that makes it so much easier. But if, yeah, I think if you're doing a short trip, it's quite hard to get into that mindset. It's something that just takes time, and you can't rush it. Well, you're <coughs> I think, uh, certainly before, well, Mono Enduro, uh, and with the trips leading up to that, because there was no internet, you did. It was hard, it was hard to find somebody who would tell you a story to make you scared. Mm. So whereas now there's, you know, the chat rooms, the internet's like overloaded with people telling you how dangerous the adventure motorcycling is and how don't go here, don't go there. This, you know, there's, you know, there's blogs galore about that. But back then it was, um, it was kind of, I think, obvious to anybody that if you could, you would go somewhere. I mean, there'd have to be something wrong with you. That's, I think that's a very British characteristic. We've been going to other people's countries and pretending that they're, they're ours for, for, for two centuries. You know? And um, so that was uh, all fine. It was only when we were on the road, having done all Russia and like that, and coming down to America, we started to, this is in 95, 20 years ago, but we, we started to get this drip feed of Americans telling you how awful Mexico was going to be. Yeah. And because we just crossed the former Soviet Union, which was essentially almost coming apart in front of our very eyes, and its infrastructure was literally falling apart. Um, we had a kind of vision of what a society in, in free fall and meltdown might look like. And this is what they were telling us Mexico was like, with an, over, an overlay of anarchy and drug war. So we, then we, got, we arrived in America not scared, and I remember when I got to the border at Nogales in Arizona, I was scared. Thank you. It was the same yeah. in 2003, <laughs> ter terrified, and it's even worse now, I would say. The Americans are always scared of Mexico, so you have to try to keep you know, true and not listen to them, because it will really put you off. And when you cross the border, of course, it's absolutely... Great. Yeah, it's pretty like the best country in the world, Mexico. Yeah. I, I, would, I would not even have a motorcycle there immediately. I'd go and live in Mexico like that. You have to come with me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, mean, I think that's Americans, right? Yeah. Americans don't own a passport. Yeah. Like They're nervous the about the rest of the world. 45% think the, the genesis is true. <laughs> now, I know it's not that kind of show. Nothing to do with your body. 90% of people think genesis is rubbish. Question each week. It's completely nothing to do with motor motorbike adventures, and um, we'll, but we will come back to that in a second. Sure. Um, and it comes back to what I was. I did some research about both. Of you. Uh, no, I, I did um, see that apparently you were in a TV series. So no, no, not Mondo and Juno or all the other stuff you've done on TV. You were in a, a Channel Four thing. You played a math teacher. Strangely. Yeah, strange enough, I am a math teacher. So <laughs> I wasn't uh, acting. <laughs> and, uh, but it was a fictional show. You were playing. Yeah, it was a stupid reality show. It was rubbish. It was called and, Battle uh, Teachers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was, I foolishly, I was, I was <coughs> headhunted for it. I remember the only teaching job I was ever actually run up, so I said, do you want this job? It was for a pretend school. And, uh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, that was it. But it was, it was, they sold, they got out, they got out of teachers in, they said, uh, it was the, it was a bloke called Jamie Isaacs, who was a whiz kid in the, in the noughties, and he'd made a show called Bad Lads Army. 
or no, he made Lad's Army, where he got a load of nobodies, and they all pretended, and they, they rented a barracks uh, called West Down Camp on Salisbury Plain, and they pretended it was the 1950s, and they, and they filmed these guys doing four weeks of basic yeah, training. Yeah. yeah, and then they all crying and everything, and they want to go home, <laughs> and all that stuff. So that's all, they, that's all they film, and then the fat one loses weight, and then the weedy one eventually does a press up, and it's like, hooray, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and so after that success, Channel 4 were like all over that company, and they said, you know, can you do it again? And they said, well, yes, they did a brainstorm, they said, 1950s school, traditional methods, teachers in gowns, mortarboards, strict discipline, no mobile phones, da, da, da. and then they did a little bit of brainstorming. You know, they did it to last around, so we said, get this guy off to Vince. He's, uh, he's Britain's greatest math teacher. We, we use that bit. We use that bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and then, then and we, so they paid me to do it, and that paid for the wedding. It's brilliant. Right. Uh, did you enjoy the experience? No. Like <laughs> 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 oh, no. It was, well, it was in the holidays, obviously, so it was, it was a, it was, you know, to, to, work, to work for four weeks full on. I mean, we were in, because it was like a fake boarding school. Um, we were in the, get the children out of bed and all that stuff at seven in the morning, and we put, we put them to bed at 11 at night, plus we had to do all our other stuff as well. So it was, it was utterly exhausting. It was much more exhausting than real life teaching. <laughs> And uh, I think that you're related somehow to Olivia Newton-John, <laughs> which I'm sure someone has said that to you before. But... I am. <laughs> Olivia Newton-John is my dad's cousin, which I think makes her my first cousin once removed. Right. And Ben Elton, apparently? Right? Well, I only found this out because Olivia Newton-John, I found out, is related to Ben Elton, like a third cousin or something. And then my friend did some complicated family tree and worked out that then, therefore, I was also related to Ben Elton, obviously, somehow. So I'm not quite sure how, but... Have met, I think I met Olivia when I was very young, I can't remember what I was, uh, she was uh, on an early tour of working men's clubs in the 70s or something, oh, yeah, sure. and she stayed with my granny <laughs> in Bath, and she was washing her knickers by hand and hanging them in front of the gas fire to dry. Obviously before she was famous. Exactly, this is it, so she, she paid her dues, <laughs> yeah. Whereas I am the kid brother of Gerald Vince. <laughs> <laughs> Founder of Honor Giro, and I put it to you, one of, the, one, of the first, one of the first bricks in the wall that we are now part of. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, now, I have some questions about the two of you. And uh, I remember talking to you, Austin, some while ago, and you said to me, uh, maybe it was on stage somewhere, and I asked you about greatest achievements and stuff. And you said, in your view, your greatest achievement was persuading Lois to marry. <laughs> yeah. so, so the question to Lois is, how did he persuade you to marry you? I'd, I'd rather no, show you. <laughs> <laughs> What was it about the young man? Yeah. <laughs> it was the overalls, obviously. Um, well, you didn't have to persuade me very much at all, did you? It was um, the tradition. Well, I only had to ask once. It, yeah, yeah, I mean, basically, <laughs> and I have to say, we were on a, a bike trip and we were uh, in rain like this wearing um, army ponchos when he proposed. So I thought, well, if it, any bloke's going to ask someone to, a girl to marry him who's wearing, you know, green. <laughs> plastic cape then I thought he's, he's got to be good for and, and how did you meet in the first place? Uh, we met because did I lay by on the A41? <laughs> <laughs> that's where I meet all my men um, <laughs> it was a, one of those friends of a friend, I was planning the, the, my first trip I said to a friend who was nothing to do with motorcycling actually we both kind of have a music uh, background as well and it was a mutual friend through, through the music world and I was saying, oh, I'm going to do this bike trip, and I was telling him all about it. And he said, oh, you should meet this guy um, called Austin Vince. He's been around the world on a motorbike. And then he said a very interesting phrase, which I always remembered. He said, he's like the male equivalent of you. <laughs> and I thought, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and when someone says that, I'm like, somebody like, God, this could go really horribly wrong, or it could, you know. So obviously, um, it was a good thing, I hope. Yeah. So, yeah, we met up, started talking about... Bikes and travelling, and one thing led to another, as they say. <laughs> and, and, and do you actually, I mean, you, you're both you know, very well known in your own rights for things you've done separately, but do you ride much together? Well, we have done some trips together. We have, our honeymoon was a big road trip together on two, on two bikes um, around kind of Europe, well, Eastern and Western Europe, so about six, seven weeks on the, on the road there. Uh, we did a, a trip across the States in a Ural sidecar, mm -hmm. which is a great test of a marriage. <laughs> taking it in turns to ride and be in the sidecar, and we stayed married throughout that. Um, we've done other, 
I mean, yeah, they ran around together. And when, yeah, Austin came out to Iran on the last time I was out there. He came out to join me for a bit. We set up our. I uh, had this idea for a, a Pyrenees orienteering event. And I don't know exactly. I don't know if we'd already got married, or if it was in the run-up to the marriage. When I said to Lois, "Look, would you be prepared to come out to the Pyrenees you know, and stay with me for a, a week while we kind of experiment and ride around all these mountains and see if we can get enough trails to create a, an orienteering event?" And she was very game and said, "Yeah, yeah, sure, that would be okay." So that was that whole uh, project was uh, very much a step into the unknown, where you drive up trails and they might have a gate across them or something like that. So it was. There was a lot of defeat and getting knocked back, so I was very, very impressed that she took that in her stride. That was fun. We had a, a big argument on about the fourth night about um, my criticising her map reading, and uh, well, it was she was wrong, so I had to. <laughs> <laughs> and so after some frayed tempers and a, and a, a couple of bottles of wine, that we. It wouldn't go away, this thorn in our side wouldn't go away. And I thought, well, we've only been married like for six days or something like that. This isn't really good. And so, look, and I thought, I need to, I need to, we need to get closure on this, or we'll, we'll never hear the end of it. You know, we'll be talking about it on TV in like 13 years. Time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I got the map out to gently, with not being, you know, not in a paternal uh, or patronizing way, to gently point out to my darling wife. What the mistake she'd made was—it was her day of bat reading. See, we did take turns, and uh, and of course she was right, and I was wrong. <laughs> and uh, but it was only after a load of, of um, uh, turbulence between us that I, that I realised that she'd been right the whole time. So that was, that was probably a very good, a very good thing to learn my place. As do we all. But we also uh, motorcycled across, well, around Morocco, and I was oh, yeah. Yeah. violently sick all over Austin. So that was another test of the. Marriage, he was very um, gallant about that. So, yeah, it's, you know. Have you ever, I imagine, maybe talked about being tempted to go and do, I mean, you've done these amazing big adventures together, to go and do a great big adventure together? We've talked about it. I don't know why we haven't really got that. I think we've got, I think we've got too many other things we want to do. Yes. We've both done that kind of thing. And because we would, if we didn't do that, if we didn't, let's ride from London to Magadan together, if we didn't do that, we'd still spend that time together. And that's my most, that's my number one objective, to spend as much time with her as possible. So, um, I don't, that's, you know, if, uh, it's the opposite. If somebody said to me, look, do you want to come on a tr such and such a trip? We'll pay you to do it, actually. I'd sort of, I don't really want to do anything that takes me away from it. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you mentioned um, Iran, and I'm skipping the African trip. That's all right, yeah. You've been there twice now? Yes, and I'm hoping to go back. It's tricky with the visa and stuff mm. at the moment. But yeah, I, it was an uh, absolutely transformative experience. I love it there. It's, it's the most interesting country I've ever been to. And it's so different to what we hear about, what we expect. Uh, so, it's just brilliant. brilliant. Yeah. Well, my only, not that I've ever been there, but the only thing I've ever watched in terms of Travel through it was mm -hmm. uh, uh, champion pretends to be a adventure motorcyclist. No, he is, but he did some 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 uh, um, another adventure yeah, thing yeah, where he, he yeah, went. Yeah. Well, I think by train through about, there, yeah. and he went through around. But him and his what, adventure motorcyclist on the train. <laughs> That's never going to happen. No. <laughs> <laughs> We've all done it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> But he was talking about the, the, the people being amazing oh, there and, amazing. and incredibly friendly. Yeah, and, and, I and mean, completely different from what you expect. Yeah, absolutely. You see, you know, it's got this image, of course, of the kind of uh, heavy, religious, uh, you know, strict, angry Muslim environment, and it's not like that at all. The Iranians are really the most fun people. They really muck about. They have a laugh. They're, they're just brilliant fun to be with, and you get the, this sort of tidal wave of, of hospitality and warmth and. and, and and fun just a minute you cross the border. It's just amazing. And I, I mean, I couldn't stop for people, you know, offering me food and take coming into their houses and giving me tea. And you know, and this is the guys and the women and ev everybody. It's just obviously that's part of the, the culture, but it's something else. It's beyond that. It's, it's just um, maybe because they've been so cut off from the rest of the world that they're really they're really happy and excited to see people coming to the country. And now it's kind of opening up a little bit more. It's you know, they're, they're, everybody I spoke to there was really really excited about that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. I really recommend it. Did you, did you ride there? Uh, you I started, I sent my bike out to um, Bulgaria, thanks to Giles. James Gargo. Yeah. Uh, and um, rode from, you might know, Moto Camp in Bulgaria. It's a brilliant place for motorcycle travellers to go. It's a fantastic kind of haven for riders in that part of the world. 
So I hung out there for a bit, which was fun. And then I rode from, from motor camp in Bulgaria through Turkey um, and then rode around Iran to like, you know, 3,000 miles or whatever. So, but yeah, it's absolutely great. Mm. I was shocked in Iran how... Um, I, I first crossed Iran in 1984, but just on a bus, several buses, uh, and on my way to India. And, um, uh, and I was in the middle of the Iran-Iraq war, so it was, it was somber. The country was literally on a war footing. And, uh, and it was um, strange being a, a, an obviously European person, but everyone was you know, nice and everything like that. But it was on this, uh, Lois was out there and I went out and joined her for a week in the Eastern holidays from school. I, didn't, I, only did, I, I was only with her for a small part of it. But I was hugely struck by the phenomenal uh, degree of sophistication, the vanity of everyone, everyone you met. Was, was, it was, it's, it's not like when you're in parts of America or, or where you can meet people who are suspicious of you, and that's when you're British. You know, because you're, you're from, you're not from that town, you're, you know, you're a stranger, that whole thing when you go to the saloon and everyone stops yeah. talking. That doesn't happen in Iran anywhere, with anyone. There, is, there isn't the staring thing, and, there is, and, and it's just smiles. And uh, you'll get, I don't know if it's because of the sanctions and people aren't doing the jobs that they were, you know, you'll, you'll be, get to a gas station in the middle of the countryside and the mountains, it's deserted, and a bloke in a suit will come out and serve you. You know, and, uh, and it turns out he's, um, he speaks English and then he's incredibly charming and you just try and imagine the equivalent of that somewhere in England. And, the, and it's just that scene, uh, that's the main thing about the Iranian experience, is uh, experience upon experience that could never happen, I don't think, anywhere else in the world. And when it, when it opens up, I urge anybody watching this to put Iran, put motorcycle around Iran in its own right, and i.e. not let's just go to Iran on our way to India, Go to Iran and give it, give it six weeks, give it three months, and I think it could possibly be the greatest experience of your life. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. You, you say it's currently quite difficult to get visas. Well, when I was last there in 2014, they just changed the, the rules for British people. So I know this show goes out to, to um, all over the world, obviously. So, but now, for British people, you can't go independently. You have to have a guide or go with the tour, which is really obviously not, not what we're all into. Um, that's always been the case for American citizens, uh, and, and now it's Canadians and Brits as well have been put into that category. But the, you know, it's a very volatile thing, the Iranian visa, visa system. It's just crazy. All sorts of weird rules come and go. So it will change again, I'm sure. But at the moment, it's tricky. But if you haven't got a British passport, yeah. you'll almost certainly be good to go right now. In fact, if you're European or Australian, or, um, yeah, Irish citizen, you can, um, nowadays, they've just changed it, you can just turn up at the airport and get uh, visa. For the first, that's never happened before, ever. So this is a big deal for Iran that they're opening up like that, to that extent. My mum's uh, Irish, but um, uh, obviously I'm about, as, I'm about as Irish as... Sammy Dennis Jr. or something like that, you know, I'm completely <laughs> English. Uh, but because they um, give away passports like sweets to the Irish Embassy in, in Ninesbridge, you, I just feel they have formed, they don't even have to go for, a, for an interview. You know? so, I've got, so I've got an Irish passport. So if you've got an Irish mum, get yeah. an Irish passport. Yeah, seriously. Because the British passport is not what it used to be. And again, if, if you've got an Irish grandparent, you can get an Irish passport. But, if you're, but not if you're married, because I tried to get one from being married to Irish Austin. I didn't work. No, they said no. <laughs> <I'm> sure. <laughs> Uh, right, I have uh, one more question before we go to the audience. Yes, indeed. So, um, the Adventure Travel Film Festival. Have I got the word interesting? Yeah, well done. Uh, oh. Yes, he yeah. has. I was going to make a sex joke. Oh. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, sorry. 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 I just remembered that my, what my job is. <laughs> yeah, I warned you about that. And the no way here, I said, Austin. No sex joke. No, no none of those okay. jokes. Well, I, I, I've been following the, the festival for yeah, three or four years. Yeah, now. yeah. And it's growing and growing, you've had to move to these yes. festivals. But it just, just tells about the, the festival. Oh, crikey. Well, it did all start, uh, forgive me if anyone's heard this before, but it did all start with this incredible experience of Chris Scott um, sending me a home burn DVD in something like 2004. Uh, and he said, you should, and he just had a post it note stuck to the DVD and said, you should watch this. Mm -hmm. And it was this film called Motor Siberia. And, uh, and I had never heard of the film or the guys doing it, and I started watching it, expecting it to be, uh, you know, not very good. I get sent a lot of not very good films to watch, and, um, and I was just sucked in. I thought, who the hell are these guys? You know, and um, and it, was, it, it was well made, it was funny, uh, and as they made their way across Europe, Ukraine and Russia and into Central Asia and then Mongolia, it was clear that these guys were utterly fearless, 
completely committed to having the most exciting time they possibly could. They never complained about anything. They loved every second of it. The more it rained, the muddier it was, the more they fell off. It was just sort of, it was all part of the rich tapestry of the experience. And it was an incredible, uh, incredible film. And then they get to Magadan, and uh, and then uh, they ship the bikes from Magadan back to Poland. And it was, and it was like the first time I'd seen um, a proper feature-length documentary made by complete amateurs, who, as far as I could tell, had no intention of trying to get it on television. It was Polish, but with English subtitles. It hadn't been made by a TV company in any way, obviously not. It was just them, <coughs> they at home. And then I started, to, people, you know, I was telling people about it, I sent it to friends, then they copied it, and they said, and this, and this kind of bootleg chain kind of filtered out, and people were, I was constantly having, I, then I got to the stage where I wouldn't send it to people, I'd copy it and then send it to people, because I never got it back. And, um, and, and there became this community of people in England who'd seen Motor Siberia, but it remained completely underground. And it was like, uh, I don't know what the word is for something underground, where it was just, you had, you had to have the DVD, you know, it was before file sharing type thing, you know, t 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And then Chris Scott sent us another film saying, I've just found out about this. He's big into paddling, uh, 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 pack rafting, stuff like that. And he sent us this film called The Yenisei River Expedition. And uh, quickly, just to finish that off, tell us about that. Yenisei River Expedition is um, a bunch of adventurers, Australian and British. Like Australian, Canadian. Canadian yeah. yeah. Uh, who I can't actually remember, so you're going to have to tell oh, me so what it was. The, so <laughs> Somewhere the, in Siberia. Yeah, these guys, these guys um, wanted to uh, paddle down the longest river in no. Russia, which is the Yenisei, and it rises in Mongolia and it issues, uh, est estuarizes in the Arctic Ocean. The Arctic bit of it is frozen for, for 10 months of the year, uh, so you have to hit the, the estuary at just the right time. So they got some rafts and stuff like that, they got a 4 by 4 to take them up into the mountains, they got in the stream and off they went. And uh, they had amazing adventures on the way. They're filming it the whole time. The rafts capsized in Mongolia and the rapids, and they all lost all their stuff. It was amazing. They were separated for five days. They didn't know where the other guys were, and then they eventually found one of them sleeping in his canoe in the mud. It was amazing. And then they get to Lake Baikal in Siberia, and then they ditched their kind of like big rubber canoes. And they and they found a, an abandoned uh, rowing boat, and they built a shed on it about about the size of maybe the back of a mini clubman built a shed on it, picked up this Russian girl, um, who, was, who then rode with them, she was some kind of triathlete or something like that, and then they rowed round the clock 24 hours a day to the, to the um, estuary of the, uh, of the Yenisei River. The whole thing took five months. It was, it was shot at exactly the same time as Terra Circa in 2001, but I didn't hear about it for another, another five years, and it was really, I'm the least bit interested in canoeing or rowing, and it was amazingly exciting. Really exciting. And so those two films came to our attention. We were lending them to everyone, and, and somebody said, I think it was Lois, said, we should, you know, we should have an event where we show this stuff that we seem to be, you know, because of the films I've made, we, we used to get sent things that, you know, and like, have you seen this? And then we realised that we were actually building up a little bit of a collection. And so we said, we should, we've, got to, we've got to share this somehow. I think it was also once we got um, this guy in America that I, I didn't know, but, you know, he read my book and got in touch, and we were emailing each other, and he sent me um, this um, DVD called, a film called Cycle South, um, which was just superb. It's like early Easy Rider, before Easy Rider, amazing 70s, dirt biking, crazy, brilliant film. Uh, and it was nowhere to be seen on the internet. Nobody had heard about it, there was no mention of it. It was just completely forgotten and obscure, and it was really, it was, I mean, it's a brilliant film, isn't it? No, I think, I mean, incredible. I mean, and so you, th you think with the internet, you think you, we always assume that everyone yeah, knows everything, everyone's everything. seen everything. Yeah, and it's like, wow. But actually, that's not true. There's still tons of forgotten gems, nuggets, and that this, are waiting to be. This film had this kind of psychedelic, drug craze, naked motocross section in it. I thought, you know, this, people need to know about this. Uh, so we thought, uh, let's show it to uh, 200 people in a field. And we did. So you, you, I mean, you're talking to you know, from the start, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. this summer's event was. More like seven, 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 at the Adventure Film Festival are um, motorcyclists. And I'm extremely thrilled when I see, um, there's too many people, names to check, but uh, Giles and Jason Dalrymple, um, just to name but a few, 
But when you get like normal people who are maybe interested in cycling around the world or just interested in adventure or interested in travel, normal people turn up and suddenly they're seeing adventure motorcycling. They're seeing the kit, they're seeing a guy with a tarp strip spread by his bike or somebody, uh, you know, uh, his and hers pair of Saros with uh, somebody, then they tend to get chatting. And it's a great way, because we're all bikers, aren't we? We're, you know, we, we're already on message. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I think we've done really well to get the normal square, unjazzed, uneducated people. They're having adventure motorcycle like put in their face, and I'm very pleased to report that they'd be quite like it. But also, you find that the, the, the adventure motorcyclists often are really into the other stuff. They're often into paddling, long distance cycling, you know. So it, it's, um, it just shows that you, you, know, you don't have to be limited to this one thing. It's, it's, the, the idea of the adventure, the, the ethos of the festival is that it's always very DIY, lo-fi adventures, you know, so it's, it's unsponsored and, and uh, people just having a go in, in whatever sort of form of transport that might be. Yeah, that's, that, sure that's kind of the, the link to it. That's what we're trying to encourage. So it makes sense, yeah. There's <laughs> a question really about solo travelling. I, I, I know Lois was a solo traveller and Austin, you're a sort of group traveller. I mean, what would you recommend? I mean, I'm quite through the question for you. Uh, I think that you kind of intrinsically know in yourself whether you would want to go uh, solo travelling or not really. For me, for my first trip particularly, it was a quite important part of it because I wanted to sort of have that challenge of, 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 of seeing if I could do it really and, and, and I think obviously that is more of a challenge on your own. And you tend to uh, have to, put, you have to be the kind of person that's happy to kind of put themselves out and, and, and speak to, to people. But the other thing is that actually you, don't, you can be as, as sociable as you like really on the road because uh, it depends where you're going in the world but it's very easy to meet up with other motorcyclists and this is one of the, I think one of the best things about the adventure motorcycling community is the camaraderie that you always stop and talk to people, people always take you in, uh, you can always seek uh, out uh, other people you know from the internet and everything so it actually can turn into quite a party. <laughs> so. You can pick and choose how, how sociable you want to be, if, if, even if you are riding alone. So, that's my thought on it. Do you want me to say something? Or was that no, you did please. Uh, I, I did this trip when I was 18 overland from, from Camden Town to, to, to Kathmandu. And uh, just buses and trains, public transport. And, um, and I was on my own on that, met other travellers, you know, other backpackers, travelled with them for a bit. And I, be, and I, I basically didn't like being on my own. Uh, when it was bad, I was, had to suffer alone and kind of dig deep and take care of everything on my own, which I maybe made me stronger, but I don't care for that, frankly. I'd rather stay weak and comfortable. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, and um, so when we did the, um, when we did the, uh, when we were getting our trips together, we uh, in increasingly had more and more friends on it. And we always had friends, rather than waves and strays, because it was all before the internet. So it was just, we would just recruit anyone we knew with a license. And, uh, and I think that when you're on a trip, uh, I, I utterly challenge the, I refute the, the claim that when you're on your own, you'll meet the local people more than when you're with other people. I think if you're on a guided tour, you really are cutting yourself off from the locals because then you have paid someone to engage with the locals for you. That really is one of the things that you've paid for. So you don't have to go and find a sprocket or some oil or an orange or whatever it is you need. Um, and... Uh, Whereas if you, you know, on Monday there were seven of us, and whenever, whenever we got to a town, one person would have to go off on their own and take care of stuff, get a visa, find out where, you know, where the petrol station was in Russia. You couldn't find, there were no petrol stations in public, they were hidden. And that was a huge mission you'd do on your own. You know, and then you'd all, you might meet back again. And also when you're on, your, um, on a group trip, every, all the time you're riding, you're on your own, in your head, aren't you? I, I would just say in summary, what I feel, uh, the conclusion that I've come to, is that it's better to ride alone than with the wrong person. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 I've been married. <laughs> <laughs> I asked Ted Simon the same question some years ago, and he was mortified to think that he'd travelled with anybody else. But, uh, yeah, he's very committed yeah. to yeah. yeah, I think he's. I think Ted Simon is mistaken. I, I was watching a piece of film that I'd shot of us in Turkmenistan, and it was a shot of all the bikes going past the camera, and he went, oh, terrible. <laughs> and, uh, and I, and I, and I, I, I I think it's really important to remember that humans are social, gregarious animals. If you were to turn your back on your, your own kind and say, no, I don't, I don't want to spend the evening looking out over that sunset at the campfire with other humans, I'd rather be on my own, I think that's a shame. It's great, it's great to, to, to have that experience, especially with your friends. 
And of course, the guy, people I did that trip with, and my brother, even though he drives me crazy, I mean, we've got a bond that, will, that nothing will break. It was really, really cool. Okay, uh, my name's Mike Simmons, obviously a uh, big fan of both of you and the Adventure Film Festival. Um, what you put on Facebook the other night, that uh, map, was it your Pyrenees Adventure because you didn't answer me? Oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, come Mike, on. Sorry, yeah, Mike Simmons. Uh, the, um, the, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it's a schematic of yeah, the checkpoints for the, yeah. the Pyrenees thing. But it looks, it look, it's inspired by the, the Italian poster for Billion Dollar Brain, which is... Un cervello di un miliardo di dollari. So it's only a million dollar brain in Italian. Ah, right. And will you open, will you open your um, trips up to the modern motorcyclists? Because I know you do. Yeah, no, we did it. It's quite the opposite. The, the, what, the main one that we do is, is uh, events, the, the virtually impossible navigation challenge event. And uh, that's, um, <laughs> that's for any bike in the world. Yeah, yeah, what do you want? Am I allowed to do an advert? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, course, course, yeah. Now next September I'm taking. I'm going to do my first kind of big adventure bike, big GS1200 KTM, whatever the, the 3000 cc. They're all these massive these these cars. These cars with two bikes. You guys love. <laughs> we're going to do um, we're going to do uh, uh, just a four day thing called Mini Mondo guided trail riding across the Pyrenees, rough camp every night, South Cape Dreamer stuff. So obviously I'll have to ch charge you to do that. But it's only going to, I'm only going to take um, eight people, so that will happen once a year. So let me know if you're interested. It will be fun. It will, it be, will fun. be fun. Exactly. Nathan Milbert is running a, a rival organisation. Uh, of, <laughs> of, they're going the other way on on uh, on posted bikes. <laughs> Stay in hotels, tell me, Nathan. Cool. Lewis, um, riding to Nigeria and um, the press about Nigeria is pretty negative when it comes to adventure motorcycling. Um, people who go as far as Ghana fly their bikes over Nigeria or get to Ghana somewhere else and put on a ship. Um, I know you rode through Nigeria. How was it for you? What was the experience? Well, it's an in interesting question because, you know, a bit like Iran, mm -hmm. Nigeria has this reputation, doesn't it, all over the world. Nigerians have a reputation. Uh, so that was the kind of, you know, the, the looming fear when I, when I rode through Africa, you know, or when I get to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and I've told you before, my dad's married to a Nigerian woman, and even she, she lives in England obviously now, and she was saying, why do you want to go there for? I would never go there. Um, so, sure enough, as I approached the border, you know, I was kind of quaking in my boots as usual. But it was absolutely fine. I mean, obviously I didn't spend an awful lot of time there, I just crossed through the, the northern section. Um, and this was in 2006, so before, you know, northern Nigeria obviously is a bit different nowadays. but. Uh, but yeah, great, great welcome. Obviously, lovely to be able to speak English again after having been in all those French-speaking countries, which is nice. And um, uh, really, really made to feel at home. Um, very, very warm welcome, even from all the immigration and customs guys at the at this little border post uh, coming from Niger. So I, I really um, enjoyed it, and I would, I'd love to go to Lagos actually. So I'm very jealous of your journey. So I think it'll be great. Thank you very much. Okay, you go, nice. I'm just. I say thanks for bringing up Iran. We did our trip. We planned to just cross Iran because of all the negative publicity, but we ended up staying for the full length of our visa because it was such a fantastic country. People were so friendly, looked after us, gave us accommodation for yeah. nothing. Yeah. You know, we had an apartment in Tehran for a week for nothing. It was it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. Good. Well, keep spreading the word because I I love to yeah try and you know let people know that it's it's not what what you think. So it's good to hear it from from you as well. Oh, a, a, a serious uh, Iran admin contribution. There's a street in Iran, uh, like like it is in a lot of countries in the, in the third world. There's certain streets where they have fifty of the same business. There's a street in Iran that's got inter inter uh, posed with each other, army surplus stores, of which they've got no shortage. Uh, I know too much of army surplus here, because they've been at war for, for so long. Um, army surplus stores, then motorcycle shops, and then camping shops. And they're all adjacent to each other. You could, if you could fly, I, I don't know what the name of the street is, but I know, I know a guy who does, and he could tell me. But if you got to that street with just a, a, some kind of financial instrument, or cash, actually, since your financial instrument is Yeah, it has to be cash. <laughs> yeah. But if you go to that street, there's tons of bikes for sale in Iran, which you've never seen in your life before. They're all based around Chinese machines, which uh, many of them don't seem to be copies of Japanese machines. Mm -hmm. But really cool stuff, 250s that come with bags, racks and everything, totally tricked out, ready to go. Um, and, you know, and they're mad, like they're a thousand quid. 
brand new. And all of your gear, you can turn up there with nothing, get everything you needed for the trip, right in that street and set off, do the whole trip in Iran, and then maybe, I presume, somehow sell the bike when you got back. Also, they have a funny thing with V5s in Iran. All the, in the, it's the opposite of Britain. All that counts is that the bikes got an owner on, on the register to that number plate. Doesn't matter if it's you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what makes the bike legal. Whereas in, whereas in Britain, you know, it's the opposite. You've got to be tied to that number plate, haven't you? By your address and all that, you know. So um, it's, it was, we, we had a friend who helped us sort some stuff out, but it seemed incredible. Incre he bought me a motorbike, a CG125. Uh, we went r running around, got stopped by the police loads of time. They never like freaked out, like, what are you doing on the bike? To them, the bike had a number plate, that was fine. That was all it took. It had to have a number plate. At the moment in Iran, you can only ride, uh, you can only get 250cc bikes. Maximum. Yeah. You can get smaller ones. Yeah, it used to be, after the revolution, it was to stop people getting sh shot on, on drive-bys. It used to be 125 and then they put it up to 250. And there is talk now that they're starting to introduce bigger bikes. Um, so, hopefully, the Iranians are getting very excited about the idea of... You see the wheelies they can do on their 125 years, no, yeah. what they'll be able to do when they get their hands on the big ones. And you know we, that thing where we all, we all love Morocco, because it's kind of so close, but you've got the, you know, the, coast, the coastal fertile strip in the north between... Um, um, Soita and um, Al Hasima, and then as you go south, you get this. You're in like, wow, I'm in the Sahara, and it, of course it's incredibly exciting. Well, you've got exactly that in Iran, but on a, a mass, much more big. You know, Iran from the Caspian Sea to the Arabian Gulf is 2,000 miles, and you and the Arabian Gulf, it's like Europe, and just near, um, not Caspian, I know some town I can't remember, but near the Caspian Sea, it looks, it really looks like Oregon. Uh, so I'm hugely struck by that. And then you head south from there and it's like full-on desert, massive desert, colossal areas with, that are screaming out to be explored. It's just, it's, it's going to be, it's, gonna, it's, the new, it's the new Morocco we're on, without a doubt. <laughs> I'm a bit of a gadget junkie myself. Um, is there anything that you guys have taken on all your trips and every time you get home, you go, why did I take that? But even now, you still take it. <laughs> I think, I, well, I'm probably the one person to ask because I, I loathe gadgets. I, I just would do, you know, I, I'd like to have minimal stuff, especially kind of anything electronic. I try to not try to take stuff like that with me. So, um, you know, I, a, a leather man is about as fancy as it gets in my luggage, but. Um, I don't know if Austin's got I, anything much I, more I, fancy I'm, than I'm that really either. content with the idea that the only three things I need are the, uh, the leather man, the Motion Pro trail tool, if you've got a trail bike, I'm not yeah. sure about a bigger, a bigger adventure bike, I'm not sure if, they, if they've got the right sizes for them, but, but for the bike I ride, the Motion Pro trail tool is just unbelievable. Motion Pro tyre levers, those really aluminium ones with the, with the 24mm you know, uh, hex uh, in, the, in one end, and an electric pump. And that's, and that's, uh, that's what my, my 20 years of experience has reduced my kit to that. Uh, and it means that, well, when I, go, when I motorcycle out to Spain every year to do those events, uh, that's what I take with me, confident that I'll be okay. I think the more trips you do, you take less and less, actually, as you go along. So I've noticed that my luggage on my first trip was massive, you know, started out with loads of stuff. And if I look at the pictures over the years, it gets shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. So I think that's quite normal. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very trivial question, but hopefully you've got a nice story for it. On your tracks, I mean, you've travelled through so many different cultural cu countries, cultures. What's the worst thing you've ever eaten? I mean, you, 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 yeah, embrace, yeah. you, you embrace everything yeah, I, I about like your trips. Yeah. And, you know, you're always optimistic. But is there something that, that, and I know that Lois obviously you're vegetarian. Well, exactly, so. and I've had to not be vegetarian for yeah. like this reason. So I had to eat camel in Algeria, which was like, oh. and I had to eat gazelle in Niger, which they'd gone out and hunted and everything, and you know, and it's like a really endangered species. I was feeling really sorry for them. They made a big thing about how to eat that as well. Uh, but those, those were the worst, the worst food I've ever, ever eaten on a trip was actually in Washington State in America, where I went into a petrol station and uh, I got a, a tuna sandwich, that was all they had left, in a plastic wrapping, and I realised it was frozen. I said, oh, can you, because I'm starving, and, then, and there's, it's quite hard to get decent food in America, actually, on the road, and I said, can you do something, you know, can you defrost this or something? They said, oh yeah, sure, and they put it in the microwave. 
a minute later, big, it comes out. So, but it wasn't fully defrosted, and so the outside was all warm and soggy, and the inside was hard and cold. And I ate it all, I thought, that is the most disgusting thing I've ever eaten. And I've never had such a bad food on anyone. <laughs> It's not very exotic, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I've, we all, we, every, every trip I've ever done, we self cater oh, yeah. uh, to hopefully try and keep any kind of, you know, a tummy sickness. I pass all in. Yeah, exactly. 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 You know. Yeah, but veg, vegetarian. You know, I go vegetarian on the road, mm -hmm. and uh, and pretty much never been, yeah. never been ill. Yeah. So um, I just wondered if you'd never been offered anything. Oh, you know, uh, stuff, you know, a mystery yeah. meat. Yeah, just because all that stuff. Thank you so much, Austin Mouse. It's been a privilege and a pleasure. And uh, I wish we just had another hour. Well, we can talk as much anyway, can't we? Thank you so much. And audience, thank you very much. James Cargo Motorcycle Shipping sponsors Under the Visor.